Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining our broadcast today. My name is Sarah Curran. I'm with Eurofin. Today, the topic of our presentation is new, a new method of Palmer amaranth identification. Uh, and before we get started, I'd like to just go over a few housekeeping items. So this presentation is being recorded, and a recording will be distributed to everyone who is registered uh, within 72 hours of the live broadcast. We will be doing a question and answer portion at the end of the presentation for 10 to 15 minutes. Any questions that are not addressed in the Q&A will be followed up on after the live broadcast. To submit a question, please use the audience dashboard that appears on your screen. All you have to do is expand the question portion of the dashboard and submit your question by, setting, by pressing send. Without further ado, I would like to introduce Denise Speed and Tony Bartling, both of Eurofence Biodiagnostics. They will be presenting our live broadcast today. Well, thank you so much for joining us today for this webinar about a new tool that we are using to identify Palmer amaranth seed. I am Denise Thied, and I will be presenting the background and context for this work and how we hope it will be a useful tool for the seed industry. And Tony Bartling, a research scientist here at Eurofins BDI, will present the technical details about this new method. Our presentation is relatively short, so we should have plenty of time for questions at the end of the presentation. Let's see. Okay, so Palmer amaranth is a very aggressive weed that is rapidly, oh, I'm, I went too far, I'm sorry. Can you go back a slide, please? All right, thanks. Palmer amaranth is a, a very aggressive weed that is spreading northward. Um, you can see in the lower panel here um, the USDA's map for the distribution for this species. And actually you can see that they have classified it as a native species along the whole eastern seaboard and also all the way up into Wisconsin. However, despite being classified as a native species um, in this map, many states are tracking the progression and spread of this aggressive weed. And you can see up here on the right that what Missouri has looked at um, from 2009 to 2016 in terms of how this weed is spreading throughout um, the state of Missouri. One of the challenges with Palmer amaranth is that it has evolved multiple modes of herbicide resistance um, to many different types of herbicides, including ALS and glyphosate um, herbicides. And that makes it a very challenging uh, weed to control using traditional methods. What we're starting to see is that because the plant is so competitive, grows so quickly, that um, in some cases it's causing uh, com a complete crop loss. Um, where, where it's abundant. So this species is also very fecund and it produces um, many, you know, up to 250,000 seeds per plant and that um, fertility is um, also increasing um, uh, the spread of this, this aggressive weed. And so the question is what can be done to reduce the rate at which this aggressive weed is spreading? Uh, throughout the, uh, the Corn Belt. So regulatory action is being taken to try to limit the spread. And so Palmer amaranth has been listed as a prohibited noxious weed in Ohio. And just last year, um, and late in the year, it was listed as a prohibited noxious weed in Minnesota. I know that there are other states uh, considering adding it to their prohibited list um, in 2017. So it, Palmer amaranth is dif 
difficult to identify phenotypically. It looks similar to many other species in the field, uh, and that also makes it challenging um, to control the distribution of the weed. So the Federal Seed Act and state seed laws rely on the tools of seed analysis to limit the spread of noxious weeds. And so seed analysis is an essential uh, component to um, controlling the spread. And so these, um, these tests are typically conducted by a registered seed technologist, someone who's very skilled in seed identification um, and accredited by AOSA or, or the Society of Commercial Seed Technologists. And these exams are visual exams where the seed analyst looks at each individual seed and identifies that seed. These tests are required for all commercial seed sales and must appear, and the information must appear on the seed label. So the purity exam is a, a visual exam where a smaller quantity, typically about 2,500 seeds, are examined. And the seed analyst identifies four components, the pure seed, uh, the other crop seed, weed seed, including noxious weeds, and inert matter in, those sample, in the sample. And those components are identified as a percentage. The noxious exam is a visual exam done on a much larger uh, portion of the, of the sample. Typically, it's done on 25,000 seeds and all noxious weeds are identified. So the seed analyst can use the all states noxious weed seed list if the seed lot may be sold anywhere within the lower 48 states, or they may use a state-specific noxious weed list if the seed is destined to be sold only in a specific state. Those noxious weeds can be classified in two types. Uh, one is a restricted noxious weed, and that would be acceptable in the seed lot at a certain threshold level, um, so it would not prohibit the sale of that seed lot in, in the state. Um, how, in contrast, a prohibited noxious weed um, may not be present if the seed is going to be sold. So it, there's a zero tolerance for prohibited noxious weeds. And these re results are reported on an official um, AOSA report of analysis. So here's the seed analyst's challenge. You know, the visual identification of amaranthus palmari and distinguishing it from all the other amaranthus species is very difficult. And you can see for the six species shown here um, that for the untrained eye, it would be very difficult to pull out one of these seeds as an unknown and put it into the proper um, species category. So to ensure uniformity in testing, to make sure that all testing labs are um, using the same approach, the Society of Commercial Seed Technologists Board came out with a recommendation for how to handle um, Palmer amaranth based on the, the noxious weed um, addition or classification. So basically the board states that this seed is visu visually indistinguishable from other amaranthus species. And so if a seed analyst does not have any additional information, such as where the seed was produced, uh, whether the field was inspected, what the type of crop is, um, uh, they, the best practice would be to list am any amaranthus seed found as a noxious weed on the report of analysis. So this, um, this recommendation um, can be translated in onto an AOSA report. Um, sorry. Sarah, can you advance that slide for me? Or 
for some reason I'm, there we go. So this shows a uh, report of analysis. Um, the report has at the top the sender's information, identifying all of the information about that sample. And then the middle section includes both the purity component of the, of the exam and the noxious component of the exam, and then the signature of the registered seed technologist that either conducted or oversaw the work that was being conducted in the lab. And to show more detail on the next slide, I've highlighted that section just to show. So on the left-hand side, you can see that that 6.9 grams were analyzed in the purity exam. And you can see the purity percentages for the pure seed kind, alfalfa, for the other crop seed, inert matter, and weed seed. And below that, you can see the detail for those components of the purity exam. So what specifically did we find and how many seeds were found of those different species? The noxious exam is on the right-hand side, and you can see that this is an all-states noxious. So it, ex it includes all the lower 48 states and excludes Hawaii and Alaska. You can see the total quantity that we examined in that all-states exam was 55 grams. And we found two noxious weed kinds in that exam. And so here you can see this is how um, that recommendation is translated onto a report. So we found seven amaranthus seeds. We, we classified them to species and included them in the noxious weed seed section. So now the question is, how does a seed company, you know, um, handle this situation now that, um, you know, um, many seed lots contain pigweed? seeds. So there's a real challenge to the industry. So to, um, to ensure that the industry had um, tools available to, um, to address this situation, next slide please, we established a collaboration. So um, Cliff Watron um, from the Minnesota Department of Ag reached out to us in late October over early November of 2016, and he asked whether uh, Eurofins BDI had a, uh, any tools, any genetic tools for identifying Palmer amaranth. And of course, he wanted, um, and the state wanted, to have an, an accurate tool to help support this new prohibited weed seed status. And the state was willing to fund um, the method development and validation for the work. So. We agreed to work with Cliff and to, to get the project started, we reached out to other members in the seed industry in the testing community, um, and specifically to Debbie Meyer, and we learned that Bob Price was using this ITS sequencing method um, in, um, in his lab, both for plant pathogen identification and also for some weed seed identification. And in fact, he has published uh, an abstract related to how he's using this tool in the latest issue of seed technology. Um, and so Bob and Debbie were interested in collaborating with us, taking Bob's method um, and trying to, attempting to validate it or verify that it would work effectively uh, for Palmer Amaranth. And, um, and so our team here at Eurofins BDI uh, included Farhad Gavami, Tony Bartling, and Jack Casti, and our team is very familiar with, you know, various genetic methods for plant and seed identification. So, um, so we formed a team, and Tony is going to talk about the details of what that team accomplished. Um, I do want to mention that there are other testing options available, um, and Illinois Crop Improvement does offer a greenhouse grow out, and so that's one, one method that's currently available. Um, there is also the ability to test for herbicide resistance, and at the University of Illinois, I believe that in um, Patrick Cranell's lab, 
that they offer that test as a service as well. And then Todd Gaines at Colorado State is working on um, some SNP uh, markers uh, that may be used for species identification. We're not going to go into the pros and cons or details of any of those other um, services that are out there, um, but we just wanted to mention them that they were available and, and could be considered. So I'm going to turn it over to Tony now, and she's going to talk about the actual method. Next slide. Next slide. So as Denise mentioned, we wanted to develop a genetic test to be able to accurately identify Palmer amaranth. And so to do this, we pursued a DNA barcoding method. DNA barcoding is a common technique used that utilizes a short standardized gene region, sometimes referred to as a DNA barcode, for the identification of animals, plants, and fungal species. And in DNA barcoding, you sequence a, this short gene region and determine the pattern of A's, G's, C's, and T's in this sequence. And you can think of it as a traditional barcode. You have this unique pattern now specific to this sample that you tested. And then you can compare this pattern to a library or a database you have of other species-specific barcodes. And you can go through and you can find the exact match to this particular I sequence pattern and make an identification down to the species level. Next. So there are several different barcoding regions that are commonly used. You can either use them individually or in combination depending on which genus or species you're interested in. We've decided to use the internal transcribed spacer region or ITS region. This region had been previously used in an older method to identify amaranth species using a combination of PCR and restriction enzyme analysis. However, this method is quite laborious and not amenable to testing a large number, number of samples in a timely manner. So we've decided to use the same ITS region but combine it with DNA barcoding to try to develop a rapid test that would accurately identify Palmer amaranth. So one of ITS region's advantages is that it has a high degree of variation even between closely related species and most genera, while it has a limited variation within species. And this is needed if you want to be able to uniquely identify a species. You want it to be able to be differentiated from the sequence and all the other species that you're comparing to. There's also a large number of ITS sequences for amaranthus that are already currently available for use in a public database that we're using for our sequence comparison and analysis. So this all results in the fact that ITS sequence can allow us to identify down to a species level for amaranthus and we're able to accurately identify Palmer amaranth from other amaranth species. Next. So this is a dendrogram showing the ITS sequence similarity of different species of amaranthus. This is just a small subset of the ITS sequences that are available in the database we're using for our comparison. So each one of these items it corresponds to an ITS sequence and then the listed species that it belongs to. And on a dendrogram, the sequences that are located closer together are more similar than the sequences that are located farther apart from each other. So here you can see that the Palmer sequences are more similar to the other Palmer sequences because they're located close together on this dendrogram than they are similar to the other ITS sequences from the other amaranth species. So all of the Palmer sequences cluster nicely together and there's good separation between the Palmer sequences and the ITS sequences from the other amaranth species. And that's important so we can have high confidence in our identification that a sequence is from Palmer amaranth. Next. So the ITS sequencing method we developed involves a few steps. We're testing individual amaranthus seeds that were suggesting are sorted from a purity noxious exam. However, any unidentified or suspected amaranth seed could be tested with this method. And this method could also be used to test leaf material if you had a 
plant that you had visually identified but you wanted a genetic confirmation of the species identity, this test could also be used for that. If we're extracting from single seed, the first step is to uh, separate all of the seeds individually and extract DNA from each individual seed. The extracted DNA is then subjected to PCR or polymerase chain reaction and that's a technique commonly used to amplify a small region of DNA. And so in this case we're amplifying the ITS gene region with universal ITS primers. Another advantage of using the ITS region is that it's present in the genome in multiple copies. So that really aids in our ability to amplify DNA from a single small amaranthus seed and allow us to get enough DNA for sequencing. And then after you amplify the ITS region with PCR, you then use Sanger sequencing to determine the sequence of this region for each sample. Next. So in this method, the sequence analysis involves the raw sequence data from the ITS region that you obtained from the Sanger sequencing. And the first step is to go through the sequencing and trim off the poor quality sequence from the ends of each read. When you do Sanger sequencing, always the beginning and the end of the reads has low, low quality base calls. So we have a, a method to trim those off and a quality control criteria to make sure we have nice sequence that we're basing our identification on. And as I mentioned, if you want, if you want to think of this pattern of A's, G's, C's, and T's as a barcode, you can see that once you get your sequence, you ha now have this pattern that you can use to compare to a database of DNA barcodes for this region for all different amaranthus species. You can compare this sequence to all, everything in the database, find the exact match, and then be able to make your species identification. For this identification, we're using a database called GenBank. It's publicly available to anyone at the National Center for Biotechnology Information or NCBI's website. We're also utilizing NCBI's BLAST function to do our sequence matching and identification. Uh, currently, GenBank has around 150 amaranthus ITS sequences that are available for comparison, and these come from 16 different amaranthus species. However, this is a, a public database that's constantly being updated, so new ITS sequences will be added to this database that will just increase the number of sequences available for comparison. Next. So this slide is uh, just a visual aid. These are not the actual ITS sequences for these species, and this isn't an all-encompassing list of the species available. As I mentioned, there are 16 different amaranthus species in GenBank that we're using for our comparison. Just to illustrate in a simplified matter how the matching works, if we um, assume this top sequence was the ITS sequence we received from our testing of an unidentified seed and we want to be able to make this species identification, we then take this uh, unique pattern that we received from our testing and we compare it to all of the other ITS sequencing barcode regions that are available in GenBank. We can go through and find the exact match to this sequence pattern and then we're able to make the species identification. So if this sequence was the close, an exact match to the sequence from this Palmer amaranth sample, then we'd be able to identify it as Palmer amaranth. And if we're not able to find the exact match, we can go through and find the closest match and then make the identification based on that. Next. So in order to make a positive Palmer identification, we've set up a set of criteria. The first is, a quality control criteria for the raw sequence data that we received from the testing. So we, we take our Sanger sequencing data and do uh, quality control trimming, not only to get rid of the poor sequence at the beginning and the end, but also just to remove any low quality sequencing reads from the analysis. And then after we put them into the alignment, we also have a set of criteria that the alignment must meet a certain minimum score and able to be used for an identification. And these steps are important to make sure that we don't have any low quality sequence that is used to make an identification. We want to have high confidence in our, our identifications and make sure we get an accurate identification. To identify a seed as Palmer amaranth, we set that the highest sequence match returned from the BLAST algorithm must be 99% or higher identical to Palmer amaranth in order for the seed to be identified as Palmer amaranth. And for a seed to be reported as not Palmer amaranth, 
the highest sequence match would be 99% or greater identical to an amaranthus species other than amaranthus palmeri. And then we would report the seed as amaranthus species, not palmer. So this ITS sequencing method, after we uh, got a protocol established, we wanted to validate it. So this method was independently validated at both Eurofins Biodiagnostics and the California Department of Food and Agriculture on well-authenticated seeds of palmer and other amaranth species. Both sites independently sourced their validation material. At Eurofins Biodiagnostics, we received six palmer amaranth seeds and five seeds from other amaranth species, and these were from well-authenticated herbarium specimens. At both sites, our validation samples were run through our ITS sequencing method and our data analysis. We found the closest match for each sample. We made our identification based on the ITS sequencing results. And then we went back to compare our species identification to the identification from the herbarium to see if we had the correct answer. And at both sites, all validation samples, we had the correct identification of Palmer amaranth or not Palmer amaranth based on the ITS sequencing. And all of our sequence matches were 99% or higher matched to the sequences available in GenBank. And as you can see, even the species that are not Palmer amaranth, for the majority of the seeds, we were able to uh, correctly identify the species based on the ITS sequencing. So it's likely that this, tech, this ITS sequencing technique can not only just identify Palmer amaranth, but it likely can identify other species of amaranth down to the species level. Next. So with this ITS sequencing, we're not only able to identify amaranth seeds, but we're also uh, discovering we can identify non-amaranth seeds with this, these ITS primers. So in our testing, we're routinely encountering Cenopodium seeds that are being submitted as amaranth seeds. And as you can see here, Cenopodium seeds are small black seeds that are being confused as amaranth seeds, and they get submitted to us for this ITS sequencing. And with this method, we're, be, we're able to tell that they're not amaranth seed. So we're able to report to the customer that that particular seed was not an amaranth seed, and we can report the, the genus of that seed to the customer. We're seeing Cenopodium in addition to other seeds of other um, genera that we're able to report. Uh, with these ITS barcoding primers, the, they amplify plant DNA, but they also amplify fungal DNA as well. And this leads to a situation where in your sequencing, you're getting fungal DNA contamination, and then that prevents us from making an identification of certain amaranthus seeds. This leads us to have a no call for certain seeds because we're not able to accurately interpret the sequence. This is either due from a mixture of sequence of amaranthus plus fungal DNA on top of each other in one sequence run, or just getting a sequence, a pure fungal sequence. And both of these situations prevent us from being able to identify the species for the original amaranthus seed, and we have to report them as a no-call. We're, we're unsure at this time uh, the source of the fungal contamination. It is known that fungi can grow on and within amaranthus seeds. Here's just a picture from the literature showing an amaranthus seed with a fungus called Alternaria growing on it. It's also known that fun fungi can be found inside the seed coat, and Alternaria and Fusarium are two common fungi that have been isolated from amaranthus seed, and these are two fungal sequences we are seeing in our testing. Some of the sequencing runs are from these two species. So we're unsure if this is just something coming directly from the amaranthus seeds. We've tried to surface sterilize the seeds to get rid of some of this, this fungal contamination, However, it's not improving the amount of fungal contamination in our sequencing data, and it's not improving our no-call rate. So it's a possibility that the, the fungus is actually inside the amaranthus seed, and if that's the case, it's really something unavoidable that we won't be able to prevent in this testing. So it is one limitation of this testing that we do get some fungal contamination in the data analysis. Next. This is just an example of a report you would receive from Eurofins Biodiagnostics, just to illustrate the, the information you could get from this type of testing. So for each individual seed, we would give you the species identification. 
sorry. Back to the slides. Back one more. Sorry, one, one more. One more. Sorry, Sarah. <laughs> so, you'd either get an identification of Amaranthus palmeri, or you'd get an identification of Amaranthus species, not palmer. And then, in some instances, we are reporting no calls if we aren't able to interpret the sequence coming from that cell, that seed. Since this is a single seed testing method. We are not able to go back and retest that seed because it has been destroyed in the original DNA extraction process. We have gone back and tried to repeat the PCR and sequencing. However, it usually doesn't change the result. If it was a no call originally after retesting, it still comes back as sequence we can't interpret and result in a no call. And as I mentioned, this is usually due to fungal contamination or just something that results in low sequence quality for certain seeds. Next. So this, this report shows how we take that ITS sequencing data and update the report of analysis. So this shows a revised report of analysis. And this, this is the same um, analysis we were looking at earlier. And under the noxious weed seed section, we've removed the amaranthus uh, species that were identified previously. And in other determinations, we're noting that the seven amaranthus species um, were not palmeri as confirmed by ITS sequencing. So we are basically revising the report of analysis based on these results. However, here at Eurofins Biodiagnostics, we are only revising the report in this way if all of the seeds from that sample were tested. Some, in some cases, a customer is only opting to test a fraction of the seed. And in that case, we would leave the amaranthus listed under the noxious weed seed section. But we would identify how many seeds we tested and whether or not we detected palmer in any of the seeds that we tested. So that is how we're currently handling um, the the official report of analysis. Next. So this method, you know, has some limitations. And Tony has mentioned a couple of those limitations in terms of no calls. Um, additionally, you know, it is a single seed analysis. Um, and there are some seed lots, you know, that could have substantial pigweed contamination present in them. So this, this approach, while it does work, um, it may be cross prohibitive for seed lots um, where there's you know, a, a large number of pigweeds. Um, it also it may have a limitation in terms of uh, amaranthus interspecific hybridization within amaranthus. We have not tested any hybrids um, between species, and so we don't know um, how this tool would work in that scenario. And that's something that, that should be pursued and investigated. So based on these limitations, you know, um, a pooled seed method would be extremely beneficial. You know, here at BDI, we use a pooled seed method uh, for other types of contamination analysis. Um, and it's a very, uh, um, you know, uh, beneficial method for estimating low-level contamination. And um, so essentially, it would allow us to test all the amaranthus seeds in a single pool. And we would be able to evaluate whether any single seed was positive for Palmer amaranth or not in that pool. And you can have large pool sizes. If your detection method um, is uh, you know, very sensitive, you can increase the size of the pool and still find that single seed. So right now, we are lacking information about a unique um, sequence that would allow us to uniquely identify Palmer amaranth. Um, we would like to, to get that information, but we don't have it today. 
Um, that if we had that type of a sequence, <clears throat> we could develop a PCR method that would work extremely well in a pool. Um, but without that information, um, we are going to pursue in the short term a sequencing approach. Um, and we hope to have some more information about that um, sequencing approach by the mid midsummer, I would say. Um, if, um, you know, if we're able to find some funding from the industry to develop um, the PCR method, um, then we'll also pursue uh, the development of that method as well. Next slide. So today, you know, what we've presented is how we're using ITS sequencing for the identification of individual seeds for as Palmer amaranth or not. And we hope that this tool uh, will be a, a useful tool um, in the, um, you know, in, in facilitating the identification of when this noxious weed is present in a seed lot. And it may, in fact, also be a useful tool for other noxious weeds that are difficult to identify. But of course, it's just one tool, and it needs to be used in conjunction with all of the other practices that go along with producing the highest quality seed. And that includes field inspections and appropriate weed control and seed cleaning and other standard good practices for seed production. Um, next slide. So, you know, if you are, are interested in submitting samples to us for testing, please let us know. We have tested um, several hundred samples in the last two months or so, and um, <clears throat> and the results seem to are seeming to make sense to the customers that are submitting the samples meaning that we are discovering Palmer in regions where it is a known, um, you know, known problem. And uh, so one key to, um, to, to submitting samples is that we would like to receive large batches of seed at the same time. So we're a high throughput lab and we do this in a high throughput format. We typically test 94 to 96 samples at the same time. Um, and so if you want to submit seeds that are found in a noxious exam, you can submit multiple seeds from different seed lots at the same time um, to decrease the cost for testing. So our current turnaround time is about 14 days, and we're looking at ways that we can um, improve that, but that's our current status. So we'd like to acknowledge Bob Price at the California Department of Ag and Debbie Meyer at, also at the California Department of Ag and Cliff Watron for working with us on this project. Thank you. So I believe we have plenty of time for questions. Yeah. This is Sarah Curran again. I am opening up the question panel, so if you are listening to this broadcast and you would like to submit a question, please do that now. Uh, Denise and Tony, I'll read a few of these questions off to you, and you can determine who's the best to answer. So the first question was submitted by David Johnston, and he's asked, does the method you discussed only ID the seed as Palmer and does not prove the seed to be herbicide resistant? Correct. Currently, this ITS sequencing method is just looking for species identification where it does not test the region of DNA that would make it herbicide resistant. There are tests out there for that, but this test does not cover that aspect of it. Someone else asked, are the ITS primers publicly available? Yes, we're using common universal ITS primers, and we do plan on publishing the details of this method as soon as possible to make that information available to anyone who wants it. 
We, we're planning to publish it in Seed Technology um, that, since that's a journal that's relevant to and, and available to seed analysts. All right, someone has asked, how far away are you from a water hemp test as well? Um, just from our current testing that we've been doing, I do think we can detect water hemp. We didn't validate the assay specifically for water hemp, so I think it would be a good idea if that was of interest that we could do a quick validation just to make sure we can accurately identify water hemp and then be able to test for it. So if that's of interest, I think it would only, you know, be by the time we get the validation samples, maybe two months to get everything and then we would, it would be able to say if it works or not. And basically that validation would be similar to what we did with Palmer Amaranth. We would, we would want to get seed that's um, known to be water hemp and other amaranth, the seed that is not water hemp, and then run it through this process and know that, you know, 100% of the time we're getting the right, right answer. It would be nice to have seed from different regions um, to account for the genetic variability that might be out there. And so if there are folks on the call that could supply known water hemp seed to us, that would be extremely valuable. We, it took a lot of time actually to get the 10 seeds that, that we were looking for for this small validation. And so that is one of the challenges of uh, uh, confirming or verifying these methods. All right, thank you. Uh, Michael Kelly submitted a question asking, how labor intensive is the sequencing method for Palmer Amaranth? Uh, it's just a standard DNA extraction and PCR, and then there are a lot of uh, facilities across the country you can submit DNA to for sequencing. So you could use any lab of your choice to do the actual physical sequencing for you, and then they send you back the sequencing results for you to do the data analysis. So, I mean, it's not a it's not a large labor investment because you outsource the sequencing. So I'd say it's a, just a common lab technique. Uh, it does take time, you know. For for example, you know, when we receive samples here, you know, um, it those samples need to be put into deep well plates, and then we have, you know, um, a crushing process that goes on. Uh, we've got tools for crushing those individual seeds in a deep well plate, and then the DNA extraction process takes, you know, a couple hours. Um, then once you've got that DNA, you know, running the PCR um, and doing the PCR cleanup um, takes time, and then, you know, that material needs to be um, repipetted into a plate that can be sent off for sequencing. So there are a lot of steps in the process. You know, and then once we get the sequence information back, you've got to analyze it. Um, so it's all easily doable, just but there are a lot of steps. Okay, we've had another question. Is it true that all Palmer amaranth is herbicide resistant to some degree? Are there other amaranth species that are herbicide resistant? You know, we're not experts on herbicide resistance, and so we really can't answer those questions. I think there are weed scientists um, at universities who would be in a much better position to address those questions. That's not our forte, so <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> All righty. Um, there have been a, quite a few questions about cost of, seed, of per test and per seed lot. That is something that we will follow up with uh, following this live broadcast. So please be aware that we'll be reaching out to you uh, with questions about cost. 
at this time, it doesn't appear that there are any further questions for a question and answer session. So I'd like to thank everyone for tuning in to our live broadcast today. And I'd especially like to thank Denise and Tony, our presenters, for doing such an excellent job explaining the process. And they will certainly be forthcoming answering your questions following this live broadcast.